Now, Amnesty International is calling on sub-Saharan African countries to protect the rights of women as well as of girls. The organization released a report yesterday highlighting that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the vulnerability of women and girls. For more on the report, I'm joined by Minky Staitler, a media officer at Amnesty International South Africa. Lovely chatting to you once again, Minky. Now, in the report, um, you focus on a number of issues, but you say here that there need to be specific protections for women and girls, specifically during this COVID-19 period. What is it that necessitated you to call for this? Yes, so it's important for us that, that women and girls are protected. As people have known that we've had a lockdown, I think we're now in the 70s and 71 days. And uh, so first of all, gender-based violence. We've again this week seen horrific cases of young women, and it doesn't matter what age they are, but these were young women who were murdered. And one of the young women was also pregnant. So for us, it just shows that um, the scourge of gender-based violence has not ended. And during the lockdown, during the pandemic, it's even more highlighted. And we are calling on states in the uh, Southern African region, but also here in South Africa, to put the same urgency on gender-based violence they have on responding to the pandemic. Um, other areas that are important to us is to make sure that uh, women and girls can still access um, health services properly as well, that they can access uh, uh, sexual and reproductive health services too, so that um, their rights are protected even during a pandemic. Now, uh, talk to us as well about uh, some of the other key areas that you covered uh, in the report that was presented. Yes. So, um, for example, access to, uh, to, to uh, sexual um, and reproductive health. So even though hospitals and clinics are obviously geared now to deal with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it's still important that women and girls can, can access abortion services, can make choices about their own bodies and do so in a safe and protected environment without judgment. And um, that's one of the other areas that we, we, we also covered. And um, also that um, uh, women and girls can access, you know, even though it's a lockdown and now we're on a different level, but they can still leave their homes if they need to find safety and, and that they are treated with respect and that their rights are equal to, to everybody. You also focused on women who are already living in marginalized situations and in marginalized conditions. Yes. And, and you state that times of, of pressure such as this marginalize them even further. What are some of the recommendations that you've made to government, some of the steps that they can practically implement in order to protect girls and women during times like this? And you, you also talk about times of war as well and how women tend to be um, the, the objects of even further victimization. Exactly, and the groups that come up, there are actually two big issues that come up, is, um, is women that, that are refugee women, women that have an asylum seeker, that have fled with their children from war zones, and specific recommendations that we have made in the past as well is that the government really needs to make sure that these women, and not just the women, refugees and asylum seekers, of course, in general, can access um, you know, health services, can be screened for COVID-19, can access food. And this is something that's really worried us uh, uh, during this pandemic, is that um, people have struggled. And women take the brunt of this because they are, or they tend to be the primary caregivers. The same comes to the right to water, for example. So here in South Africa, we've launched a campaign around the right to water. And, and never, you know, water is a basic human right. And it should be flowing into people's Caps easily, accessibly, clean at all times. But um, COVID-19 has shown that even with something as simple as washing your hands isn't always that easy. And again, women have, bought, have burned the, uh, you know, the brunt of it, carried the brunt of it. They have to carry the water from long distances. It's often unsafe, uh, especially when there was a curfew. It was difficult for people to leave their homes, access water. So these are all issues. And what we've done with regards to water is we're calling on the government to, of course, they've been delivering tankers, but what is the long-term sustainable plan for water going forward as well? How are these tankers going to be seen, maintained, and how is infrastructure going to be put in place so that communities, and in particular women, can access these basic human rights? 
you, you made a rather interesting observation as well about the effects of curfews and lockdown on, on women. Won't you break that down for us? Yes, so um, of course it is understandable that the government was doing its very best to, uh, you know, to, to keep people safe, to, co to combat the spread of the coronavirus. However, of course, things like curfews and having to stay home does have an impact on domestic violence, for example. Um, it's interesting to note, though, that where other countries have said that there's been a massive increase in calls to emergency lines, for example, it hasn't been quite the same here, apparently. However, we do worry that this means that women are trapped with the perpetrators of the abuse and therefore cannot actually even pick up the phone. And therefore, not being able to leave um, the house even you know, after 8 p.m., that's not passed, but, you know, for a majority of the lockdown, that was the case. Um, these issues really do impact the safety of women. And we have to point out that um, when the safety of women is impacted, the safety of children is impacted as well, as we've seen so tragically this week. You, you, you made an interesting observation. I mean, obviously, your work is, is continental and you're focusing in this particular report in sub-Saharan Africa. But you made a correlation between a rise in teenage pregnancy and, um, and, 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 and certain diseases. And this is from the study that you did in, in Sierra Leone. Uh, give us the details behind that. Yeah, so uh, uh, we did some studies and we've just put together, now during COVID, we felt that it was important to put together all this information. Yeah, um, uh, just for example, obstet um, obstetric fistula, um, uh, teenagers not receiving the care necessarily that they need when they are pregnant so that they can, can have um, safe um, pregnancies. Um, and and, and that's, the, that's, that's what we look at. And for the support and the summary, what happens to it now? It's, it's all done. You've, you've made the recommendations. Where to uh, from here? And, and, and what do you hope will be the final outcome and the results that will emanate from it? Yes, so for us it's important to engage with governments um, and, and not only to, and to come with solutions, of course, because as we've seen, you know, governments do also made up of human beings. And, and what we do is we do write letters to governments when we've done research like this. We also ask them to, you know, give their views to us. We engage with them during the research as well. And now that the research is done, we follow up and we, we, we ask them do they want to engage further. And of course, the hope is that research like this will influence policy making and policy decisions so that the human rights of women, of children and of everybody is, uh, is really protected but also an everyday reality uh, through the implementation of law. Well, we thank you so much uh, for your input as well as the work that you as Amnesty International uh, continue to do on, on the continent and specifically focusing on the rights of women and children uh, during such stress-intense times. Thank you, Meki.